John, jump right in. The floor is yours, sir. Awesome. So thanks, guys, for coming. So we're going to look at kind of streamlining MEP today, uh, mostly using Dynamo. So the first thing is kind of why are we doing this? And, you know, I, I'm sure if you've been in industry and worked, we just do stuff really labor intensive. So I would call the mouse being our number one tool. And I think we need to get away from that. So that's really why. Hopefully we get away from the mundaneous tasks. Hopefully we get more time for actually designing and problem solving and less time clicking and dragging. So that's really what it's all about and why we're doing it. So some of the learning objectives, we're gonna build some parametric families or just look how we can use those to help us. Um, we're gonna look to pulling linked elements. So again, this is kind of an HVAC workflow, but this would really work if you're electrical, pulling data from ME, or from mechanical, pulling data from architecture, structural. So really any other link models to learn how to pull some stuff in. Um, we're going to really try to get the most out of our MEP systems. I think they're underutilized just because it is kind of tedious and time consuming to build them right. So you, but if you build them right, you get a lot out of them. And then we're even going to touch a little bit on some machine learning aspects and how we can apply those to um, some workflows. So it's pretty cool. I like it. So kind of the big picture here is we really want to take all this data and again back rather than clicking and dragging all the time, we really want to use Dynamo, build algorithms to really push all this through not only build our model, but then really have really controlled data. Um, I think with automation, the data is a little bit more guaranteed to be accurate. So then you can harness that for even more and look at everything. So that's kind of the big picture, taking a lot of data, analyzing it, building algorithms. So before we start, I just want to give this idea out there, and it's the whole idea of a relational database. Have you ever heard of one? I've heard of it, but tell me what me what and is, Mark got into conversation a little bit. Like what is? I've heard of a database. What is a relational da database? So is the whole like idea is it like Tinder database? Like what is what is <laughs> this relation? It somewhat. All right. Um. So the whole idea is just to build these like primary and uh, foreign keys. Okay. And so you have these tables. If you look at like spaces we will use the space number to go to all the diffusers. So now we know what diffuser that's in. Really? Yeah. That's incredible. So it's kind of what I think Revit does in the back end. We're just going to do it our own. So we are going to put kind of all these ones with the black keys in front of them. Those are parameters that we put into our families, and we are going to utilize that to really let data flow. So Is in the it, background, that's really what's going on. So are your keys, are those your inputs? Is that user input from the user, or what is the key? So we've, we've managed to, it's really a space holder, and we've managed to automate all of those inputs. Okay. So it actually isn't, and right, so if it was manual, it'd be really time consuming. It'd be like, why are we entering all this data? No, this is two more columns of, right, these get up to the hundreds, thousands. Speaking of which, can we pause for just a second? You and I got pizza and beer last night. That's true. Yeah, and so we were talking over beers last night about our past and our experience working in different industries and just the sheer amount of pushing a paper and data entry and how processes are broken in our industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, just as like your own observation of the industry of where you're like in the MEP space. Yeah. Like, is it as ba bad in the MEP space as it is in the architecture space or what? I think it's pretty bad in the AC industry in all. In and the only thing I really have to compare that to is we talked about this last night is I had the, I took a year co-op working in manufacturing and they streamlined everything. It was one piece of data was entered and it went everywhere else that it needed to go. And so I was really inspired by that. And then when I got into this industry, I really took those principles and then found out it's kind of called Lean Six Sigma principles. So I took all that and that's really what opened up my eyes to be like, no, this is not, I don't think the correct way to be doing that. So. Right. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, right, so throughout the whole process, this is kind of how we're sharing data between each other. We have these links to be able to say, okay, give me all the VAV boxes on each space which therefore leads to like, okay, I can pull VAV box data into my rooftop unit data. So it's a way just, and then with Dynamo, right, you're always pulling, filtering. So give me all the VAV boxes that are on this rooftop unit. So what is Dynamo for those that have Ooh, like- I wrote a whole article on that. Did you? question. All right. Dynamo to me, uh, I mean, I don't even know how to answer that quickly right now. Dynamo for what we're doing right now is kind of a way to, I'd almost call it like a, database management system, okay. I think is a term that's thrown out there with databases and everything. It's so like a pro it's a programming language, right? Like a right. visual yeah. way to, to program, right? Yeah, and of course it works really well with Revit. Mm -hmm. um, we also get into a little bit, it does a lot, some stuff with geometry. We're gonna use that in the MEP cool stuff, like placing stuff, so. Which you're gonna show us today. Which we're gonna show today. All right, cool. 
So it's kind of a relational database. Put these type of things in your families to be able to control the data, right? If not, you need a system built. And it's just kind of working backwards, I think, at that point. So now we're building those systems kind of in a different order. Yeah. And I think that's more powerful. And that's why we have to do this. So the next idea is just kind of parametric modeling, right? You can get, you can do it all through Dynamo, but it'd be really hard. Why not just add parametrics into your families and just get it out of the way, right? Yep. So then if I pump in, you know, 3, 550 CFM, then I'm going to have a one foot neck. And that will let us be able to adapt really quickly. So you have these parametric diffusers right now that you've built? Yeah. So, so like when I first started in the industry, we had this kind of table that we followed. And I was in Excel, and I was again, what, what's my right? What's my CFM? Okay, there. And of course, maybe memorize it eventually. But now what we can do is just put this table directly into Revit, and if it changes from 100 to 200, the next size it updates. That's great. So that's some of it too. All right, so now let's get into the data part. So I did my loads here. So you guys know HVAC workflow. We're kind of so everything comes from two f sources really, and I think it's code. We had kind of that conversation last night, right? Yep. So if you build something in California, it's going to be different than Florida. So codes is a big driver, and we'll get into that a little bit. And then also loads. Yeah. Which, which oh, go ahead. Well, loads come from the architecture model. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do loads really quickly through Insight. So I'm not someone, you know, this is another thing you could have a whole hour presentation on. Yeah. But we're going to go through it real quick. But it's a pretty accurate way if you put the input some of the data correctly to get your loads. It's very visual. So if you have a client, architects, you could all sit around the table, see the changes, mm -hmm. why we just suggest a certain system or why we suggest, you know, higher insulation and stuff like that. Um, so it's really powerful. So this is inside 360. This is yeah, so like it's energy free model. too. Yeah, oh, it's free. Or is it part of the is it part of the industry collection? If, if you have Revit, it's free. Okay. Uh, from 2007, and you can see. So those corner spaces have the highest load. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. And it's all visual. Everything's about visual. Yeah. Like if it, you just get these printouts with like train trace, that's just a whole bunch of data. So I'm curious. You mentioned architecture versus MEP. I think this might be a good spot. I always like to have some interaction. Um, because otherwise people start drifting off and they're starting to answer emails and stuff. Yeah. I'm curious if you guys can, in the uh, chat window, tell us if you're on the architecture side or MEP side. Um, a lot of this stuff, like I, I have, I've never used Insight 360, so this is really fascinating to me. I think it's, it's really incredible, so thanks for showing this. But in the chat window, let us know um, if you guys are in the MEP space or architecture space. And I think the big takeaway for me is that the architect is handing off the model, so you're coordinating. Like if you, even if you're part of this, you're like, oh, this is MEP stuff. No, like on the architecture side, you have to feed this information, it sounds like, to the MEP engineer or the designer, or how, where does this hand Yeah, happen? it is it's kind of a, like, what's your walls, right? Mm -hmm. U-value is a big part, which even boils down even more about R-value, which is exactly what um, elements, I guess, you are building with, mm -hmm. put all those together. And yeah, it is kind of written form right now. Um, this gives you a way to at least have that discussion and see the impacts and decide on that number through data, not through rule of thumb right off the bat. That's great. So yeah, I, this is something that I'd really get a, a business or building owner involved in too. That's awesome. Um, right off the front, you can just have a really visual, good conversation. So the next step in all this process is we went from that thing and I, got, I copied and pasted all this into Excel. And see, this is a lot of data right here, and it really makes no sense. I mean, if you've been in the industry and you kind of know what to look for, it does. But visually, it's just taunt, it's just a lot, a lot of data, right? Just rows and columns. Right, just rows and columns. So let's say what, if we can get all this into Revit, not only can we start visualizing it, but then we can utilize Dynamo and Revit to make decisions based on all this data. Okay, right? getting excited. Awesome, all right? right. Um, so some other places. So it's running right now. I ran it just so we didn't have to sit here. So it's running in the background right now. Probably the fan. That's probably why the background noise, <laughs> guys. Sorry. Um, so two other sources of data, and this is the code part. Comes from like UFC. So each space has some requirements, right? Oh, uh, so this one's ASHRAE, and then we have this UFC code, which is tons and tons of data in here, in a lot of spaces. So in this first script that we're doing, we're really running. And UFC code is no relation to the mixed martial arts show that we watch on no. on Spike TV. Correct. No, no okay. I never put those two together until oh, yeah. just now. <laughs> oh yeah. What is? Do you remember what UFC stands for? Is it Universal Foundation Class? I think is what it is. I'm not sure. I know yeah. it's government, right? So I started in uh, government, health care, military. 
like really niche. But I like the UFC code because it's very black and white on what you need to do. So it's very easy to turn what they're saying in the in this big long like 50 page PDF, but you can read through that and start turning that into like if statements and code to drive stuff. Really? Yeah. That's incredible. Like okay. there's ones, we're not gonna go too deep, but there's ones that say like, um, I know one that we talked about was for operating rooms. Like you, the supply diffuser needs to be right over the operating table and the return diffusers need to be on the floor as far as away from the operating table. So you know enough dynamo to be, well if I have that point, then I can get those points pretty easily. Yeah. So you can just build into that. That's awesome. All right, so we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. All right. So we started with this link model, and uh, we didn't have any spaces or anything, so we did pull in all the linked rooms, and we pulled out, most importantly, this code value. Okay. And then we were able to use the VLOOKUP in Dynamo to pull in all the rest. So again, now we just have a lot, a lot of data to do a lot, a lot of cool stuff. So not only did we pull in UFC, we pulled in ASHRAE, all this right this is all manually done before yep manual crazy and, and so you inputted it from the architectural model or what did you get this so data? the codes right so the codes so in this one i just used the name the room name yep and this is again it goes back to that relational database kind of idea um the name came in from the architect model we made a space from that name yep. from its location okay got its number and then we went into our excel sheet and did a v lookup type thing but with dynamo in here to get all the rest of this data and so, pull it in. So did you push this data from Excel to Revit via Dynamo? And does via that Dynamo. Yeah, we can look at the, the, the graph real script, whatever we call them nowadays, real quick. So right, so here's that workflow it just did. So we start with a link model um, using, you know, the community is awesome. So using some uh, packages, Archie Lab here, pulling in the uh, rooms and the doors. So another thing we did is we placed error transfer family mm -hmm. to be able to build those relationships between spaces. So that will come in useful later on our calculations. So really, and this is kind of cool when you just look at it like this, right? So we got the location, and then we got the name, number, room occupancy code, or room code. So that's one of the lookup values. Occupancy, because we need that for equations. Hopefully they do. I used to count furniture, and I was like, this is not right, guys. <laughs> Why are we counting furniture? So hopefully you can get that, right? You yeah. Guys, they do fire rating, like fire. Like yeah. They have that data. So yeah. many people occupy that room. So we're pulling that in now, and also, the room name. The thing I like about this, I'm pointing at your screen like everyone can see me pointing <laughs> at your screen, but right here. Yeah, the thing that so you're this is a code block right here, right? And then yeah. you're putting in, you're basically grabbing information and then pushing information. Mm -hmm. And so with this, and then you've renamed it. So for those that know, I mean, it says get architectural room data, but that isn't like a, a node that you got out of Dynamo. This is what Dynamo calls a code block. Right. So and the node that you got out of Dynamo is this get parameter value by name. Perfect. And there's the node to oh, code. Yeah, that's great. Let's do that real quick because this is awesome, I think. And to me, we t it helps organize the data. Like this with a whole bunch of strings would just start looking real messy. This is incredible. Yeah, this is a really, right. really nice. Because I've done that. I've had this string, of, and so you use the code block. I start getting obsessed where I don't like string, strings. Like I got OCD about it where I don't like strings crossing. Oh, yeah. And like I go out of my way not to let strings cross. <laughs> and sometimes, like especially with Python nodes and stuff, it's almost inevitable. But... This is so much cleaner than how I've done this. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Cool. And I, I'd like to even collapse it more, but yeah. then you get to the point where you kind of lose. And then you also get to these text notes, too, mm -hmm. of what's going on. So, right, so why, where are all these ones coming from? Well, we're setting the default values that we want. So we have a whole bunch of parameters in here to c control stuff down the road, and we just want them to zero right now. Sweet. Right, so we, made, we got the space location, made the space, set all the space parameters, and set all our default parameters. Um, it's cool, too, with the graph in the background. You can kind of really visually see some stuff what's going on. So then, yeah, so we'll touch on this a little bit. Um, so this is like our input from UFC code. So, right, we're getting some Excel file stuff here. That's what this is doing. And then, see, I even have to go back and look. It's been a while. So we're moving spaces, no match. So that's something to keep in mind, I think, when you're doing this, yeah. is you can really, if your dad is not good, you kind of need a way to fix it. So yeah. this part right here, all it's doing is being like, oh, we didn't find a match. So don't run it through the list because you'll either get null values. So for those that have used Dynamo before, you have like a filter Boolean mask uh, mm -hmm. utility you could do. But this, you're doing it this way versus like a filter Boolean mask, right? Like is it a way that... It's kind of just in like, there you could go on, I could go in a lot longer on this, but it's really kind of a way just to make sure, like it's all in the list, right? So at some point you have to break that list up. Yep. And then maybe you want to put it back together down the road. I like it. Okay, so, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, so then we're finding kind of an Excel table. And if you look here, right, so 58, 8, 
where these are coming from is actually from, and notice a lot of stuff's hidden because there's so much data in here. Mm -hmm. um, so like one of these is row 58, and that's where those numbers are coming from. So we found a match here, and it looks exactly like the VLOOKUP, which is where I started, by the way, with Excel when I started getting into all this stuff. Um, Excel led me to asking questions and starting to do it. But then I learned to get rid of Excel, so that's where we're at now. So that's where that number's coming from. So you're keeping this all in Revit via Dynamo now? Yeah, when it used to be two separate things, and it was just messy. You had two redundancy, only get rid of redundancy. So it's really that idea um, for everything. There's a lot of similarities if you look through this. Uh, so same with ASHRAE. And then it's done a little bit differently here for looking up all that data, our load data. But again, with one click of the button, let's get back to what we're doing, not getting into details too much. With one click of the button, we are able to populate all this data. It's incredible. Right? A lot, a lot of data. More so than you do it if you did it manually. So then the next step in the process would therefore be to start doing our calculations. Oop, taking an overdrive again. <laughs> I feel like your computer's going to start hovering like in a minute. It's like... Almost like, you know, like a, a drone, just like the fan coil is just going to push your computer <laughs> off of the table. Well, it's this way, so it's going to come out here. <laughs> so that's the first script. So now we can do calculations. And this script's really cool because it can be used all throughout. Um, this one doesn't take that long. And so here what we're doing first, we are pulling in all the equipment because things can change, right? So my air, my rooftop unit, and it has to be ran twice. That's my own coding thing because it relies on stuff. But so it's run it twice, you're good. But then run it any time down the road, and you're good, and we'll update everything. Seriously? So we're, we're going to revisit this okay. graph later. Sweet. Well, let's see what we just did here. So, all right, so not only are we, we pulled in spaces, but if you also notice, we're pulling in here, we're just pulling in our rooftop unit. And so we're pulling data from that to go into our space equations. So if I go back to the PowerPoint real quick, I mean, oops. So that's kind of what this one's about here. So in these calculations, right, we're able to. This looks a lot cleaner than it would in Excel. Yeah. And this is how it looks in those if I zoomed in. And here we're actually, right, so outside air, percent outside air, we're actually pulling from this. So I'll leave a little cliffhanger at the very end. We're going to update the outside air and everything's going to update. It'll be really cool. Sweet. So. Uh, so we go to calculations now. Where are you? Some schedules. So I like to make a whole bunch of schedules too, just to see kind of what's going on. It's a little bit different, and then it's even kind of a work through to go through. So these are like working schedules. Yeah, working schedules. Um, this one might eventually become something that goes on a sheet. Uh, it's required for all HVAC, kind of, right? Mm -hmm. Minimum air, maximum air. But all this, right, was done. Here, we can even go back. So I think this is a really good point, like here, for working schedules, for those that don't know, um, some people are like, cool, like I just have to schedule this stuff, or like, monkey up the schedule that I'm putting on a sheet or printing, whatever, you can actually create a working schedule as your own kind of quality assurance, quality control schedule. That way you're not messing up the, the one that's going to be... Right, the production. For, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I like that. Like I said, all, this was all pre-baked, right? So all these are pre in here, good mm -hmm. to go. And look, I literally like numbered them out too, right? Yeah. So another interesting thing here is too is we have this transfer in parameter. So this one's really cool, just because if we go up here, so then we can start visualizing this data, right? So now we've kind of figured out the space, and we can start visualizing this data through these different floor plans. Of course, they look silly. So can we? Add, so we got a few questions in here. Yeah. Um, so someone is asking, how much of your code blocks are made of packages, downloaded versus scripted content like Python code? Zero. Zero. Yes. Um, Python, unfortunately, you cannot put in a code box. So, like I'm saying, I'm always trying to collapse. Mm -hmm. If a Python node's in there, you can you can't collapse it into that. Gotcha. So you actually have to string it out. So yeah, all code block is. Oh, I was going to show the node to code too. So, I work when I'm like thinking and trying to think a problem. I start with let's grab the node. Let's do that get parameter value by name. So this is pretty cool. Um, of course, to do this, you have to have elements in here. Let's go name. Oops. That doesn't matter. So right, so I have this. If I click on these and do a left click, usually. 
Nossa, meu Deus. Maybe I lied. I'm doing something silly because it's not showing up. Sometimes it's like really picky based on if you pick on like the header versus like somewhere else, right? Yeah, usually no decode. Hmm. It's not showing up. Might have to revisit. Yep. So I'll make a post on it for you guys. That'll work. No decode. Yep. Best thing ever. And it collapses down to this, then with a little bit of changing, you can kind of change stuff and make it look a lot prettier. So that lets you build, right? Because we all like Dynamo because it's easy. You don't have to have the programming language. I'm not a coder. Like, like I'm learning, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not there yet. So I just start writing this. So you're able to build these things and collapse them back down. And then you can start moving stuff around, which is really cool. So one of the only inputs into this whole space calculations is spaces. So like, that's kind of cool. It is. Back to you earlier, you were showing Insight. Um, Devin did have a question about that. He wanted to know if you've ever compared Insight load results to more robust load calculation software like Train Trace or IESVE. I did. I did a controlled comparison and even had some of the people on. I reached out to the Autodesk team over there. Yeah. And they helped me out a little bit. And with a controlled comparison, it was 98% correct. So, where does that 2%, which really doesn't matter, I don't think, with loads? If you look at loads, it's. It's, it's, really it's not a it. perfect science, right? It's once you get into like thermodynamics, it's pretty intense of like getting the exact values, right? Where I think that two percent even came from was the measurements. Mm. So like, so we're doing manual measurements going from wall to wall. Well, you can see by Revit's nature that you might have a little different sure. values from there. So yeah, I think it's uh, pretty accurate. Unfortunately, it's not one hundred percent trusted. But again, for a preliminary workflow to get a good idea. I, I think it's valuable, and then of course I hope they improve it, and hopefully someday it's satisfied. It's good. Um, the other thing that we were talking about too is so importing the data in could also work with like train trace, right? You can export from Excel, so you could easily do the same kind of setup with that. That's awesome. So the analogy I always like to use is Dynamo is kind of like a broker, right? Like talking to all these different. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, exactly. So that's a way that you could execute that. That's awesome. Yeah. So where are we at? So you can start to visualize, of course, something's happening here. But so what's going on right here is we placed all these air transfers. So this space usually would show up, but this space would be negative pressured because it's an exam room. And so that's where we're able to calculate kind of this transfer air right here. How are you visualizing that data right now? Is that a Revit filter or is that some MEP out of the box? I think because Dino is on, it's messing it up. It should be beautiful and colored. Okay. It's not, but notice how this is darker. Uh -huh. And this is a different color and this is a different color. So this should be green, this should be blue. Gotcha. But I think Dynamo being on is, oh, I know what it is. What is it? Preview. I changed my settings. In here somewhere, there's a Revit preview setting. And I bet you that's what's on. Show, is this show run it? preview? Is that it? There's one that's like, show it in Revit. Does anybody know where it's at? I'll find it. Yeah, Maybe it's view. beautiful. View? View. Here, you know what? We don't have to do this, because I luckily, being kind of smart, yep. was ready to have some stuff go wrong, right? Yeah, Karma. Of course. Whatever. These are always <laughs> fun when we do these live things. Right. So here, let's jump to this one. So let's keep going so we, yeah. we get through it all. Yep. So, um, right, so we did some calculations. So here's one that was cool. Simple ones, pull stuff from data. So another problem that happens is, like, UFC code has these A's. And Dynamo doesn't handle, or Revit does not handle A's well. What do you mean when you say A's? Because it's very, uh, so... All right, so let's go to like pluses and plus. So yeah. there's a symbol in the UFC table. Like, see, so we have these Ys right here. We have these pluses right here. We have these Os right here. We have yep. these exhausts right here. Yep. So they mean something, right? But for Revit, you can't necessarily write an if statement like that okay. without building more parameters. Maybe you could I get work that. around. So what I did here was make an if statement. So if, if, then we're going to be 20%. L less air than the return than the supply air, right? And then there's some rounding in here, so it looks a bit more complicated. But it's letting us handle that text a little bit better than what you could do in Revit. That's good. And if you did this in Excel, it'd be a really, really long, hard uh, equation to see. Yeah. People are telling us too that preview is under view. I was wondering if we went into Dynamo if it's under view. Let's try it. Okay. Why not? Yeah. Under view tab. View. 3D preview. 
Revit background for right. you. Oh, oh, beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Devin and William. Appreciate that. Yes. See, I knew I was in there. I was messing with those those yeah. things the other day. Yeah. It's good. And so now it starts making sense, right? So negative 40 for these pressurized rooms. Negative 80 for this bathroom. Um, these are positive, so positive. And then we're able to build those relationships, push it through. So that's the calculations part. Like I said, we'll revisit that. So right, again, one step, and we just do all that. You have to talk about it forever. Like, we can talk about it more than it's crazy. For sure. Um, so let's go to the next one. So this one's really cool. I didn't know how to do this when I, like, this was like, I always like to have a problem and be like, how am I gonna solve this? Rather than being like, it can't be done, so I'm not gonna try to solve it. Yep. Like, this is my goal. I had no idea how I was gonna do, finish my goal. I had no idea. Yeah. Because these funny issues happen. So let me hop in to PowerPoint real quick. And just to be clear, like you said, like last night when we were talking, like you've run out of Google, like yeah, you've done all this. In, yeah, like, I mean, there's parts, right? So there's parts of it, but Googling. So, so Googling, I found an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. So this is a little bit of the unsupervised machine learning we're going to tackle. And so this is my sketch from when I was trying to like think through this problem. And I, I just like sharing it. This just shows you kind of the process. And so this would be my sketch for like a zone thing. And right, it kind of looks like these floor plan things, right? So this is my idea. And I was like, how do you divide this up evenly? Yep. You can't necessarily use like, divide it down the middle because you might be splitting these clusters or these groups in half and you don't want to split the groups in half. So like that's kind of what this sketch led me to. Okay. So how do you get those groups first off? You kind of use this hierarchy thing, right? So you don't want to put exterior walls with interior rooms, exterior spaces with interior spaces. So that'd be one. So like, right, that might be our first gap. Yep. Then a corridor would be on its own space. Or not a corridor, like a conference room would be on its own you know, thermostat, right? Uh, you don't want so many. Um, if they're different set points, then that'd be your next breakdown. And you're left with kind of using that data that we pulled in, right? Yep. You're left with, this is literally the output from Dynamo. That's awesome. Down here. And you're left with these groups that you don't know necessarily how to divide. Mm -hmm. So again, finding Google, finding a little piece of it, I learned this k-means algorithm. And so I'll try to talk through it. I don't expect you guys to understand, I have a visual. But the whole idea is that we're trying to find, you kind of give it how many clusters you want, and you have to get start locations, and then you have a whole bunch of points. Well, our points in this scenario is all the different spaces that we've already grouped. Um, the number of clusters would be how many exhaust fans you have necessarily, or like how many VAV boxes you want, and there's other ways to get to that number. But what's really cool about this is if you change either of those inputs, then the outcome of the algorithm would change. So you can imagine try doing something in Project Fractal where I'm testing five exhaust fans, three exhaust fans, a range of options, and push into this algorithm, and then getting a range of different zoning options. That's awesome. So that's kind of where I'm headed. I like it. That's where we're going. So here's kind of visual, if you guys probably didn't get that. So here's a visual. So this one, we're just trying to group kind of VAVs, are these diffusers together. And our K points are these VAV boxes. So you can see that this thing is iterating through until it finds these three clusters. So I just thought, just watching this run to me is really cool. And like knowing the math behind it. This is great. Yeah. So then, do all this. So then there's one here. Actually, I'm going to hop in here real quick and run it. So here it is. So here's where we're kind of doing that, right? That first part, that dividing the spaces up into certain groups. And then this is my looping of k means. It could be done better. I have it in Python, but the idea is if it's in this, it can go to fractal. So that's what all this, and it's just a loop, right? Loop, loop, loop. Um, and then here, let me run it. And for those that don't know, Project Fractal is an optioneering software in the Autodesk Labs. It's a way to kick up a bunch of options in, with Dynamo up to the cloud. It iterates on those options, and then you can, what they say, optioneer um, those options uh, based on whatever whatever you want to optimize, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. So there we go. So we just zoned the building, right? So we started with no spaces. We did the calculations. Well, first we pulled data. We did the calculations. Now we just zoned the building. And so as you can see that these groups are fairly together, I would like to see this line together, but that's tweaking. So the other cool thing about these machine learning algorithms is that's one simple example, and the easiest one that I was able to use the quickest, but there's 
dozens of these. You just blew my mind. Different ones. So you just zoned it like automatically. Yeah. By running that, that's incredible. Yeah. And I, you know, it's right. Maybe it's not right what you would do, but it's not gonna lie and put a space that should be 68 degrees set point with one that should be 72. Mm -hmm. Right. So all these, if you remember, these were like those exam rooms. It found those, put them together. And all it, these are the same type of rooms. All of these six right here. Now, if we go back to the PowerPoint, you can start to kind of see, right? So that's what the that was that cluster right there, and it divided it. Maybe not perfectly. There's tons. There's tons of room for improvement on this zoning one. And like, this is kind of everything past this is pretty linear. So this is like really exciting. Imagine adding cost into this. Oh, totally. Like. Yes, to your where, point of like in your previous experience in fabrication, like entering the data in one place and literally have it. That's a word. I think I just made it up. <laughs> but you literally push the data from left to right all the way through the process, streamlining it. Right. At, at some point. Okay. Yeah. I like it. So again, this one was probably the hardest, most challenging one. I was like, I don't know how to do this. And everyone told me like, you can't do that. Like, right? Because it's really hard for a computer to visually see the stuff that we see. Yeah. And this is where you get into the machine learning stuff. That's great. It's literally what pretty much machine learning does. Is like try to give computer eyes. That's my non-data <laughs> science analogy <laughs> for what machine learning is. Um, so then the next idea is, okay, so I thought, you know, we did this, but then how would I assign the, like, assign the thing? I could divide it right down the middle and be like, left side gets air handling unit one, right side gets air handling unit two. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's not engineering, that's kind of just cheapskate. So I was thinking about, and then I remembered the center of mass equation. Right, so center of mass is kind of like you have a table and stuff's different density. Where's my center of mass? So I subbed out the mass part for CFM, so Ooh. you start to get this weighted average on where to divide the building. Interesting. So that in this example, I don't think it worked well, but I did some other test examples and it worked quite well. Really? So like rather than, and you could even do it with load rather than CFM, right? So That's I want my air handling to the most equal amount of load that I could possibly get. So we're gonna shift the center of mass. The line to divide the building down by half. Okay, so I'm not a mechanical engineer. Is that uh, an equation that mechanical engineers use, or is there another formula? It's that not. That's not an equation I don't think any mechanical engineer would use, but it's an idea from somewhere else that you're trying to put into that I'm trying to use yep. to do it. It's just kind of a weighted average thing. Oh, okay. So that's what it did. It, it divided down the middle. And this guy's kind of an outlier because it sits on this zone. But right, if let's say we had some heavy labs down here, like this is a lab, and it required a huge load or something, then this line would slowly shift to the left where this division line was. That's awesome. And then if you have four, right, then maybe you want to find not only a split in X and Y, so different ways to approach it, but it was just the one that I thought was fun to kind of find, and here's thinking outside the box a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so we've zoned, so now we get to place in equipment. So okay. let's hop into our next one. So this is kind of... The other idea, like the data areas where I started. Oh, I have to give a shout out. I closed it. I have to give a shout out to Taiko. He's my brother from Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I've never met him in person. He's an awesome dude. He MEP over package has all the stuff to do that automatic zoning. So really? it was not. It was one thing just to do it right with numbers, but it's another whole thing to do it to actually get Revit systems. That's awesome. Our Revit, right? Yeah, and it zones. Yeah. So there's a lot of Python, and he helped me out with it. That's awesome. Uh, and there's uh, some other stuff coming up, and I'll, I'll give him a shout out again. So go download that package if you're an MVP guy and play around with it. It's good. I like the Dynamo community. There's a lot of oh, yeah. sharing. Dude, it's crazy to me that this guy's in the Netherlands. We've never met in person. Yeah. And yet we've spent and the 10 hours together on a computer. And the power of the internet, like, yeah. you know, talking to someone in completely... And it's, it's way more people. I've pulled in people from all over that helped me with this workflow. Like, um, a guy from the Middle East helped me with placing uh, the diffusers when we get to that, so. That's great. Much smaller world. Yeah. Like, I was working from Turkey. How crazy is that? Yeah, I know. Like, that, like, blew my mind. I was <laughs> like, yeah, hop on. Here we are. Insane. So let's run this one, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Get the PowerPoint. Um, so right, so placing stuff. So the first idea of placing stuff is kind of find the average point. So like this, it perf this kind of graph really represents what we'd be doing for exhaust fan. So right, so we have these three, let's say, exhaust spaces that all find the exhaust fan. So we are going to put the exhaust fan in the average location on the roof. Okay. So same idea of the rooftop unit, right? Yep. Give me and remember all those keys that we were talking about mm -hmm. at the beginning. I do. So now we're using those keys to filter all that. 
all those spaces to be like, give me all the spaces that require rooftop unit zero one. That's great. And now find the average X point, average Y point, and put it on the roof. So this might be in relationship to that comment. Someone is asking me, um, Evan is saying, how did you uh, get those spaces classified in the first place? For example, how does Dynamo, quote unquote, know that a particular space is a corridor? Like how did you, was it based on those keys at the beginning or? Based on keys, having a good architect, like do you just call our stuff corridors or corridors, agreeing on that? Not yeah. core, C-O-R, not core in some ways around it, but right, just architect, what are you doing? Yeah. Looking over that spaces. And I've then all it. the other classification is done, all that comes from, again, these UFC tables at the very beginning. So when I've done this before with engineers, I was always on the architecture side. We had like a typical parameter that we used to coordinate room types, like what the Yeah, and that's exactly, functional. so in the real world workflow doing this, that's exactly what this room code is right here. So again, if we go room back code. to it, okay. we pulled in from the architect as one of the ones was room code. Yep. We pulled in that room code, and that was let us find all the rest of this. I love it. Which let us right. So here's my winter temp set points. Um, I don't think we're gonna get to it, but since I have this open, so another really cool thing is these things right here. So you have C code. One of these, I don't know them off the top of my head. I don't memorize, but one's like add a CO2 stat. Add this room needs to be pressure controlled. This room needs humidity control. And so like you could literally have this trigger. A uh, hey, there needs to be this in that Ooh, room. I know exactly where you're going. That's awesome. I've done it, and I just don't have it ready. We can look at the table. So there's actually okay. a table in Revit. So that's another cool thing. Absolutely. So then just place in the room, and then we'll get back. We're definitely right. going to have to have a part two on this. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's some, a lot of stuff in the pipe. So I'm always trying to evolve it, too. So, pun so intended right, or no pun intended on evolve? Pun. <laughs> Not, yeah. I always have to ask. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So, right, so that's the first idea, is placing stuff that type of way. The second idea, and this is what I do for um, thermostats. So not only can we place kind of average points, but then you start to get the vectors and moving around with vectors. Oh my gosh, this And this is, is awesome. bringing back, right, calc three for people. I failed it once, I, I failed calc three once. Yeah. But here I am, and I never thought I would use it. But here the first are. couple years of my industry, now here I am, right? So the cross product one, right? Yep. So the whole idea here is to give me the, right, so first find the space that you want the thermostat in. So then give me the door, and you could go deeper to be like, is this an exterior door? We don't want that one, right? Gotcha. You don't want a thermostat on an exterior space, you want it on an interior wall. Yep. So if you have a good architect that labels that, get rid of all the exterior walls, right? So then give me all the doors, then give me the point location of that door, so then we get this blue vector from that point to that point, and then we use cross product from that point. So then we find the host that that wall's on, or the host of the door to get the wall. Now you can find the direction of the wall. So then we march a vector out in the A and B location at like two feet. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can pull in more data from the if it's a wider door. Could you just how say wide that? is this door? Yeah, march out that much. Yeah, right. So it's really half the door width plus whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean that's where they go mostly. So then it's, okay, what point is closer to the start point? And that might fail in very rare equations, mm -hmm. but what point's closer to the start point? Okay, give me that point, and now add the blue vector and the selected pink vector together to give you the green vector, and that gives you a line. That line will intersect that wall. After when it intersects the wall, you'll get that intersection point. Boom, that's where my thermostat goes. I like it. Add whatever elevation is required for your receptacles. So this is a good one, talking to you other guys like electrical, imagine receptacles mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like, is there a refrigerator even? So now let's talk about like mining out data. We have a really good architect. He's gonna say there's a refrigerator. We found the refrigerator center point. Shoot a vector to the wall. So there's all kinds of applications. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is incredible. Um, and the other thing with those other like equipment stuff, that's how I'd go about building rules. So mm -hmm. another good one that like those curtain walls, right? So I need a air curtain wall. Give me the door. March out a vector just a little bit from that. It's incredible. Place it. So do you have an example of this? Um, so I broke the thermostats like right before. Okay, right before the presentation. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I ran diffusers on accident first. Okay, so let's jump to diffusers and then I'll go back and show mm -hmm. you the other one. So diffusers are pretty cool because, so not every space requires like the same rules when work for every space. So again, you have a classification of spaces. So one rule that I use, and the rules could go on and on, like view UFC, for example, right? And just as you build it up, just each each time you do a job, like improve your rule set a little bit. 
and just keep it going. So I use four rules for this example. First one is small spaces. So I think it's like give me spaces under 200 square feet. I probably know there's only going to need to be a supply and return diffuser there. Give me the door point. Well, first I made like an X. Give me the points. Test them against the door. Give me the furthest one away from the door. Give me the closest one away from the door. Put my supply and return. Sweet. Exhaust. Give me all the toilets. I got written up by UFC. Dr. Chuck's comments once because this thing was shifted like that. Really? Right. Yeah, really. Big deal. <laughs> so, right. So, we're going to find all the toilets in the space. Find the average. Put it there. Um, if there's two rows, right, a little bit more complicated, but again, you can work through it. Um, corridors was a real challenge, and I had no idea how to do it. We tried to do, I did a whole bunch. Bill helped me, Con Connelly, right? I don't know. Good guy. Helped okay. me build. We figured out some stuff, but then I kind of settled on this rule. Yeah. yeah. So this one just tests all the doors against each other and finds the doors that are the furthest apart and puts my supply and return in that location. And then we have this rule to kind of go cover all the other spaces, which is kind of based on building grids. So to do grids, have you ever messed with grids on surfaces? In uh, Dynamo or in mm -hmm. Revit or? Anywhere, I guess. Yeah, I mean a little bit with uh, Dynamo and trying to get the grid locations and placing them as model lines for uh, Navisworks. Yeah, so that's a, yeah. But other than that, just normal like Revit production, um, but that was my only Dynamo example with grids. Yeah, so we go more into detail. It's really grabbing the ceilings, right? So you get the ceilings, you get a surface, you know, have a surface, you do UV lines on it. Yep. Boom. What's even cool is the gap could change based on the velocity if you want to go even deeper. Yep. So. So you're taking into account, that's what I was thinking when you were showing the previous examples, is, yeah, you're putting these in here, optimizing them, but you still have to coordinate with ceiling grids, so you're taking that into account when you're... The, you're this workflow does not have the ceiling grids. I'm working on that right now. Okay, sweet. I'm, I'm almost there. Sweet. Except it involves... CAD, unfortunately. Oh, man. I know. Yeah. So silly. We'll have to talk about that. I went to a hackathon just to try to answer that question. Really? They were like, no, nah, we want to do something different. So let's go back in here. So here's what's kind of cool, too, is you start to see all this stuff. So here's those crosses I was talking about with all those small spaces. Here's kind of the grid lines I was making, referring to those. Here's my corridor points. So that just visually shows you everything that this graph is doing. It's incredible. Yeah. So we have small spaces, right? corridors, and then it all comes back together here to put them, oh, I have to mention this one. How many people out there get the email Friday afternoon saying, we moved the ceilings, can you please adjust your diffusers, even right. though you thought they were hosted? Right. Because they delete the ceiling on you. Uh, and then it's a host element, so you have to go through there and do it manually. Yep. So, no hosting on these, uh, this was a big argument I've had forever, and I think I'm winning now. <laughs> My old bin manager gave in, and uh, <laughs> I had some other people give in. They're like, all right, I see it now. Sweet. Because, right, the hosting was for a problem that no longer exists because of Dynamo. Yeah. So the end of the script puts them all to the ceiling. And so you could take that out and run it by itself and say, hey, man, put all the diffusers to the ceiling. That's incredible. And then you leave on Friday on time. Or oh, not work that weekend. Right? That's really, really great. Okay, so we did have a question as it related to that. It said... Is the space point the middle of the room or self-assigned from the center? Mm. If you auto-create them, it's going to be in the middle of the room. Well, if you copy them, again, on the architect, Depends on the there's direction. nodes, too, that readjust it to the center. Okay. Um, by the way, I built this architecture model, hence why it's not perfect, but I purposely did stuff to throw things like that off. That's awesome. To test it, so that's why this space is really weird. Got it. Right? You might have the center point. Oh, you can't have the center point outside of it, can you? I don't think so. No, not with rooms. You can with uh, families. Right. So this one's a little off, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a node in Dynamo that will recenter those for you. Spaces and rooms. That's great. FYI to everybody. Yeah. Five minute warning, by the way. Oh, sweet. So, yeah, we can get there pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so we did a whole bunch of stuff. We placed a whole bunch of stuff. Here, let's just go to the 3D view. Oh, we didn't run the. Here. So you gotta trust me on the thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to. Time flies when you have fun, man. Right. All right. So let me just run. I do want to do this one for you guys. Place air side equipment. So I do want to end on the updating everything. That'd be really cool. See, that's right, broke the thermostat. Gotcha. <laughs> it happens. It does. 
So yeah, so after doing this, this around time, I'll keep going. So after doing this, this was the estimated time of time saved up front. So number of inputs, number of clicks. For the small building, 13 hours it would have taken to run through all those manually. That's and incredible. I think that's conservative. And notice I set it up front, and hopefully in this five minutes, I'm going to show you the past up front where we're updating, which I think is actually more time than the upfront time saved. You know, I like this because this is like, you see Dynamo examples and it's always some twisty tower, crazy bridge. And mm -hmm. you know, I've been having a slide in my PowerPoints that says pragmatism sometimes isn't sexy, but man, it saves you so much time. So much time. And we have like uh, one client we were working with, they had a project doing data center supposed to take three months. And based on what Sean's been doing, it took a week and a half to two weeks for them of executing these scripts, um, but saving kind of that three months of time that you typically have to do those types of things. There's some really, really powerful ways that you can automate a ton of this stuff. So let me, so here's a really cool one that I'd like to do. So system builders, so people don't build systems. It's too time consuming. I've okay. literally been told that. It's too time consuming to build systems, not anymore. All right. So we had all those keys in there, so we're able to filter, group, sort everything together. And what is system builder? What is that? What do you mean? So you systems, let you do really powerful things, so all that. Each one of these would have been clicked, add a system, name the system. Really? Blah, 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 blah. That's awesome. Ask people if they use systems. I'd like to hear. Yeah, do you guys, yeah, do you guys use systems? Um, Here's the real power of systems. Now that I have systems, generate layout. Go, oh, look at this. I mean, like, everybody. It's crazy. Oh, my God. Generate layout. Dude. Systems. So you're generatively designing these stuff work, like the flex pipe, everything. So this is going back and utilizing the stuff I said that you could utilize if you use Revit systems appropriately. That's awesome. Um, you can do pressure drop. There are some workarounds still, um, but right next level would be through pressure drop, which we have. So the last thing I really want to show is the updating, um, updating everything. Watch your browser. Most everyone is saying they're using the uh, uh, they're using systems. Some good, are that's good. I, I was unfortunately not with people using systems, and we really had no control, right? It just not only does it keep stuff together, but there's a lot of benefits. Um, of course, those aren't showing up. Why? Uh, it's on this workflow or this. Uh, oops. So there's my rooftop units, and right, right, the center. Um, tag all. Tag all air terminals. Okay, right now we have zero CFM in here, right? That's no fun. All right, so someone, again, another input. Yep. So let's go back to that script two. Yeah, it was 15 minutes for build, actually. <laughs> That's right, rerun. Changes were made, diffusers removed. So what are we doing right now? We, is we this are updating, updating everything. All the we're data. Going back to that second script and like re-pushing everything. Oh, so here's yeah, where yeah. it set diffuser parameters, set air handling unit parameters, set VV parameters, set exhausting parameters. Yep. Boom. Ready for this? That is incredible. Let's go back here. We run it. My mind is getting blown right now. TG. Boom. So you went to 30. All right. Last one. It's really, I thought it's really cool. Wait, so you added those diffusers and it changed the calculations for the one above and added these to 40? Yeah. Right. So let's say you're architects and people, here's, here's why architects get us in so much trouble, right? They move our walls. Yeah. So let's go all the way back real quick and recap. They move our walls. That changed the equation for the volume which changes the airflow, which changes everything down the pipeline. Yeah. So this is able to update all that. that so you guys change the roles on us, it's not this big ordeal. It's okay, rerun the algorithm. This We're is good. incredible, absolutely um, incredible. So if we go schedules here, and remember this percent outside air? Yeah. Say we're trying to be efficient, so we're gonna go to 2.5 outside air. Yeah. Right, so that was an input in my air handling unit. And we rerun this. And everything's going to be accurate. All your stuff's going to add up. 
So we get in a situation where we had these tables in Excel, and then someone manually entered in the Revit, and then blah, 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 and by the time we got done, stuff just didn't line up. Right, there's yeah. all this discrepancy. Yeah, yeah. Like, where is that? And then we're spending hours um, trying to fix it. Oh, I guess. Hmm. I think it did it. Maybe not. Have to look. But as it goes, as you're going through that, um, I want to mention really quick. Um, this is part of the lab live we do. We give out free content to you guys. Try to. Um, inform people and, and if you didn't know about some of these processes or what you could do at Dynamo, it's kind of like one of the free things that we try to do at Evolve Lab just to kind of get back to the community. Um, as it relates to that, I'd like to just say if there's an opportunity, you guys have a project that you guys want um, some help on, you want to try to automate some of these processes, you want Sean to come in and do a training, teach you guys how to use some of these. Um, we're in the process of building up a lot of these scripts um, for people to use. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some of these that we're giving away for free, as people are asking already. Uh, as we said, they, people are going to be asking. Um, so we have some of these we're giving away for free, but a lot of this is going to be if you have a project or some assistance that you guys need, um, Sean would be able to, to help you guys out with that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of tailoring, too, to the thing. So there's big picture, and then there's setting up, right? Yeah. the parameters to do this. We added a lot of parameters in, too. Yeah. So as it relates to that, um, we have, uh, yeah, do you want to, so real quick, Sean and I are going to be uh, at AU. Um, I'll be doing a story time fairy tale, a uh, case study on designing theme parks with them. Uh, Sean's going to be, do, well, you, you explain what you're doing. So we are doing a round table with a whole bunch, like, the, the panel stacked. Like, yeah. I was, like, so honored to be on it. Really? Ronnie's on there. Um, just a stacked panel, just talking through some of the Revit issues about sharing Revit files and the needs of each other. So it's everyone from business owner, architect, MEP, uh, MEP electrical guy, Lonnie with the construction. It's awesome. So it should be fun. Carl, Carl I know is a popular speaker. That's great. So, um, and I do know we're past time, so just to update you guys on that, we have AU, and then we also have our membership, which is absolutely free. We have like free scripts, we have our forum, um, the newsletter, uh, videos like this, which we do for you guys. And then we also have um, our subscription. So that's where at some point, like I said earlier, if you guys have a project or need some help building some content, families, Dynamo scripts, training, implementation, you guys are trying to take this to the next level. We're working with uh, someone that wants us to start uh, 1st of January, just automating all of this stuff for them. And then we have other ones yeah. that we've already, you're getting excited about that yeah, one. Yeah, I'm Twitter excited. They've, they've set the bar high, but yeah, it's I'm excited be. to... Uh, use our team here and yeah solve some more problems it's incredible Doug Otto Ryan's on there it's in the works definitely yeah it's interesting this collective neuro network of having Sean's expertise and others on the team is absolutely incredible um, so with that we want to thank you guys for coming to this session um, if you guys have any questions thoughts comments uh, feel free to hit us up on the website evolvebim.com we have uh, the forum up there we have contact us just reach out to us be there and you guys enjoy the rest of your day. We'll be in touch. See ya. Thank you. Thanks.